States and welcome to this uh, Thank you very much. Well, thank you for everybody for coming as well. And this, uh, earlier on, I see the coffee and the croissants are really useful. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work of this uh, Rebuild Consortium this morning, which is three years into a seven-year program of looking at a range of health systems issues in countries we've defined as post-conflict. But as you'll see from the seminar, that's actually quite a complex determination of what's post-conflict and what's not to even, to even start off with. But the idea of the, of the consortium is that we're interested in health systems in post-conflict settings which presumes that there must be something particular about them for them to uh, form the basis of a consortium. And yet it's not something that I think even the members of the group are necessarily convinced there is something all that particular about them. So this um, seminar really represents our own rambling thoughts as we move towards trying to understand what is it about post-conflict health systems um, that um, distinguishes them from others. Um, the Rebuild Consortium uh, is a partnership that's led by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, um, myself uh, at Queen Margaret University and Tim Martin at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine are the research directors of the programme and we have partners in Sierra Leone, uh, Uganda, Zimbabwe and Cambodia. So part of the reflection here is also once we're a little bit clearer about what we mean by post-conflict and how post-conflict health systems might be different, how do those countries fit those definitions as we go a bit further down the path from when we started things off. So just to give you a, a, an idea of the structure of what uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, first of all I'm going to sort of dwell a bit on some of these definitional issues about what is post-conflict and what are the other uh, related kinds of um, categories that, uh, that we're thinking about. Then we did, early on in the, in the work of the program, two literature reviews, one on health financing issues in post-conflict environments and another on human resource issues in post-conflict environments. And we've gathered together some ideas from those that are relevant to this question about whether, whether health systems are indeed uh, different in such countries. Then we're going to go into a little bit more depth into two of the countries. Sierra Leone, which is our country, <coughs> something which is self-evidently post-conflict conflict and fits all the, all the criteria. Zimbabwe, which may or may not, and which is therefore quite interesting in terms of honing down into what we really mean by it, is Zimbabwe post-conflict or not, helps answer some of the questions about what post-conflict might mean in some ways. And then um, we've got some thoughts about distinctiveness of post-conflict health system issues, but I really hope that those will be thoughts that will encourage some discussion around the room about whether or not there are really some special issues about these consequences. So post-conflict uh, states, if they can be clearly defined, defined would, would seem to be a subcategory of fragile states. And fragile states are useful uh, as a starting point because international agencies have defined fragile states have constructed lists of fragile states, and therefore there's some kind of concreteness about them. But the concreteness might stop there. If you look at these three uh, different definitions from different international agencies, um, or people writing uh, to inform different international agencies in the case of Elden, um, you see that these definitions, while they have quite a lot in common, are actually really very vague. And what does it mean, for example, if we use DFID's definition, cannot or will not deliver core functions to the majority of its people? Is the UK a fragile state, if you think about that? Uh, it's really not very clear what, where the boundaries of cannot and will not uh, and core functions and majority are. So they, they vary, so there's no universally accepted definition. Dif donors have different criteria, and because their criteria are different, their lists are different, so we don't just have one list that everybody agrees on. Most countries have at least some of these characteristics. If the UK does, that's true of, of just about everywhere. So does that mean fragility is normal? In which case, well, it's pretty meaningless, isn't it? Um, but there isn't something in common in all these definitions that people conceive of fragility as something that's a temporary state, uh, something that states, states move in and out of, 
Um, it's not clear how temporary, and it might be quite a long-term temporariness, but it's an idea that you're not necessarily uh, consigned to fragility uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, definition of what your state is. But non-linear in the sense that you don't necessarily move in and out of them in a smooth sort of way. You can be uh, thrown into them, um, and you can also jump out of them quite, quite uh, quickly as well in some circumstances. That is not really how um, Paul Collier sees his bottom billion states, though it's quite different. It's more like the economist's view is that some states are really in a pretty persistent equilibrium of being stuck in a se with a series of problems, which Paul Collier doesn't call fragility. He talks about, he talks about these bottom billion states, but um, it might be something pretty similar to fragility. So then post-conflict, or conflict-affected, which is another, another term which actually, as we're moving into the uh, later stages of the work, we're more inclined to, be, to find the term conflict-affected more useful. Um, one of the problems with post-conflict is for how long are you post? I mean, everybody's post-conflict in the sense that everybody's state has had conflict in it in some state, in some, some time in the past. And certainly, again, the UK is post-conflict in the sense that the Second World War, as we all know from, from this weekend's documentaries, is now exactly 70 years since D-Day. Um, are we post-conflict for 70 years? Well, generally speaking, people are not considering the period of being post-conflict that long, but if not, why not? What is it about this the, the period closer to the conflict that is special? And certainly, you know, again, to think about the UK, which probably most of us are most uh, understanding of its history, we do think there was something particular about those post-war years that um, characterised them and that characterised how things changed. And I think it's quite useful to think about that when we think about today's post-conflict states, that we're not a million miles from it ourselves and that that might give us some understanding about what might be different about them. But we have these three types of, types of labels for states that are clearly overlapping, if not entirely so. And they're characterized by a range of uh, characteristics that we might identify uh, as, as relating to them uh, in different ways. So the point is, as it says at the bottom, different aspects of fragility are intertwined. And it's hard to pick out one set of things as defining one area of that. Of that <coughs> Now, the literature also um, are, suggests that there are a series of fairly clear stages related to uh, conflict and post-conflict, that in the period leading up to the conflict, you have a deteriorating state, a collapsed state, uh, which characterized the con conflict as a characteristic of a collapsed state, and then you have a period where the state is recovering from conflict, and DAC, uh, in particular, argues that you've got an emergency and stabilization period of one year, a transition and recovery period of one to four years, and a peace and development period after that, with recognition that there's a, a serious uh, risk of, of relapse during that uh, recovery phase. However, we're going to suggest that we don't think it's anything like as clear cut uh, as that, and that these, and that this is a rather optimistic. Uh, idea about how states emerge from conflict. Um, so not, in none of our uh, countries does it seem like you've got a nice clear recovery from conflict of those kind of characteristics. So at this stage we can already be asking, you know, to what extent are the four rebuilt countries really post-conflict countries? And as I said earlier, I think Sierra Leone is the clearest case. The whole country was involved in the conflict for a prolonged period which was armed and had fairly um, uh, straightforward and um, close to everybody's conception of conflict characteristics. Um, Northern Uganda isn't a whole state that was involved in conflict. It's obviously only a region of the state that was involved in the more recent conflict. Uh, so that after there was peace in the rest of the country in 1987, that continued until about 2009. Um, and then Cambodia is generally not on most uh, lists of post-conflict because it's too long past its, past its conflict. The Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1991, so if you date the end of the conflict from then, we're, what, um, about 20, nearly 25 years post-conflict. Most people would say that 
the, the level of insurgency and, and continued unrest that it con continued after the Paris Peace Accords dates what you might call real peace from 1999, so <coughs> about 15 years post-conflict. And you know, say most, most agencies are no longer considering it post-conflict. I'll get to why we wanted to include it in, in a little. Um, the biggest question really, and the one that sort of people most uh, sort of blink at when we say Zimbabwe is, is on our list of post-conflict countries, is, is what Zimbabwe's gone through conflict or not? It's not uh, you know, country-wide armed military conflict. There have been elements of armed uh, violence. Uh, so, for example, the oppression of the Indabeli um, in the sort of early post-independence post period in which maybe 20,000 were killed. That sounds pretty much like, like armed conflict, so in a sense um, you've got uh, classic characteristics of conflict. On the other hand, I think what we're most, most interested in is the more recent period of economic disruption that doesn't have so many characteristics of armed military classic conflict, if you like. Um, the major, major characteristics of that were unemployment rates at 92% in 2008. Basically, nobody's working in, in those circumstances. Inflation in millions of percent to the point that they can't use their currency anymore. I mean, it's the closest to a complete economic collapse if it compares to maybe you know, post-war Germany or, or something. It's, it's, complete, it's complete economic collapse. And then the question of is it, if, if this is counted as part of the conflict, and some people would say it's, it's deliberate uh, economic aggression against uh, certain parts of the population that were threatening not to uh, continue to support Mugabe. That's one, one take on what was going on in Zimbabwe. If it was conflict, is it now post-conflict? Or does that actually continue and just because they've now moved on from insisting on the use of the Zimbabwean dollar that's become useless and have switched to other currencies and so the economy has started to function a bit better again, does that make it post-conflict or not? So I think one of the questions, and as I said I'm going to talk about Sierra Leone and, and Zimbabwe in a bit more depth, um, one of the questions for us is, is Zimbabwe you know, a good case for us to be asking these questions about health systems in post-conflict countries, or is it one that we can kind of consider a control with a different kind of disruption, so that we can actually maybe distinguish how disruption uh, differs in terms of its impact on the health system uh, from, from more classic orange conflict situations. Okay, a few things that probably most people are aware of about why uh, it might be important to focus on fragile or post-conflict states. As I say, more agencies have lists of fragile states than post-conflict states. So with the data, therefore, relate to fragility <coughs> more clearly than to, than to post-conflict. But if we think about fragile states, one-sixth of the world's population, but a third of those living on less than a dollar a day, so the concentrations of poverty in those countries, more than a third of all the maternal deaths, half of children who die before the age of five. So, um, if we're living in a world of thinking about trying to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, if, if there are particular things about those kinds of states that we need to understand to help make that kind of progress, then clearly uh, we need to understand what they are and to engage with them rather than to assume that they're the same and we can use the same strategies in such countries as in other living countries. Um, there are also, of course, uh, seen as a global threat as well as, so it's not just a humanitarian case if we want to tackle poverty, uh, that's where we've got to try and, try and uh, address things. If we also want to look after our own interests in terms of um, new diseases that could threaten us in terms of the, um, over, um, the, the boundary crossing of conflict and terrorism effects, then we've also got to think about these kind of states. And yet, they are relatively neglected. If you use a kind of model to predict how much, if it's need that attracts in international investment in your state, how much uh, investment would you expect? They've only got 40% of the level of investment you would expect. And that's for obvious reasons, I think. These countries are difficult to work in. They don't have governments that are easy to um, get into agreements with. Um, they may not have governments at all. There are all sorts of reasons why that's the case. 
until quite recently, the Scandinavian <coughs> agencies explicitly ruled out working in fragile states because they considered it too difficult. They've now about turned and are, 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 are prioritizing fragile states. But that's the, the tension. Do you want to go where the need is most or where you can achieve most? It's not an easy question to answer. It's for example, about turned that question. Now, New Grander, who was mainly working in Afghanistan, proposed this list of characteristics as being typical characteristics of post-conflict states. But I think most people with any experience of health systems in low-income countries would say, well, these are pretty much the same as one would describe as being the problems of health systems in low-income countries in general. Perhaps they're more, more so in more fragile or post-conflict states. But these are are problems that I recognize from working in countries like Malawi, for example, which probably is, stands out very clearly as not being conflict affected, or at least not recently. I um, won't read them all out, but uh, I'm sure you've got time to, time to sort of skim through them by now. Our colleagues in Uganda came up with this list of things that may be the basis for suggesting that health systems in post-conflict states are actually different because these things might be different from other low-income countries. And of course, our colleagues in Uganda are best able to see the issues of low-income but stable states, or their regions of Uganda which have been low-income but stable, and the regions of, of Uganda which have been uh, dis disrupted by conflict. So they identify this list of things that might be different about, about health systems. And so in looking at the two case studies, we're going to be looking at to what extent the issues in the health system are more the first kind of list of new branders or the second kind of list of our, our macro-area colleagues. And then just a little bit before uh, we get to that about some of the ideas that uh, drove um, the uh, thinking of the rebuild program and then also a little bit about what we get from the literature review before we get to those case studies. So, um, I think it's already well, related to the reasons why post-conflict and fragile states are neglected in terms of investment, they're also neglected in terms of research. They're more difficult to do research in quite often. You've got weak uh, partner institutions with uh, weak <coughs> research capacity often, um, often because people have, have left the country who have those kinds of skills. Um, you have uh, disruptions in data collection, so you may not have secondary data you can rely on to the extent that you might be able to in other states. Um, and researchers from outside may fear to go there. There may be continued disruption that makes them countries that people think thanks but no thanks about. The other idea um, that kind of drives the rationale for doing this research is that it's quite possible, because there's certainly an idea out there, that in this post-conflict situation you've got an opportunity kind of blank, blank sheet to do more um, innovative things, to do things that might, where you have more established political um, power bases, be blocked because they might challenge political, um, political interests. So, for example, um, often you've got systems of posting health workers to remote areas in which there are vested interests in uh, maintaining a pretty inefficient system where people have essentially um, benefit from, from being in control of that, of that role. And maybe that if you don't have those kinds of vested interests, you've got more scope to put a better system in place, just to give one example. But lots of things that you might want to do in the health system might be blocked by vested interests that might be much weaker in an immediate post-conflict setting. So there might be an opportunity to set uh, health systems in the appropriate direction. So we wanted to think, first of all, to what extent that there is really that policy space, if you like. That's, that's weaker vested interests give you more opportunity. And we've also wanted to think about what are the long-term implications? To what extent can you actually set things in appropriate direction with different kinds of policies at that point? Sorry, these these boxes are reversed. This is really Sierra, Sierra Leone and Cambodia that helps. Oh no, sorry, Sierra. Yeah, Sierra Leone. I'm, I'm wrong. The right Sierra Leone and Cambodia allow us to think about the long-term implications. 
and Zimbabwe and northern Uganda more closely emerging from their <coughs> periods um, help us to think about the immediate policy space. And that, to go back to something I said earlier, is one of the reasons why we included Cambodia, even though it's no longer on most lists of post-conflict states, is because we wanted to see the long-term ramifications of the things that were done in what's sometimes rather pretentiously called the post-conflict moment. But, uh, um, it can be quite useful, useful uh, expression. Um, where, so, so this, if you like, allows us to, to see what that post-conflict moment looks like close up. And this helps us think about what the long-term implications of what's done if there is an opportunity there. OK, so very quickly, I think, uh, about the existing literature. I be pretty quick about the existing literature. There are problems in time frames. It tends to be relatively short term, really focused on the uh, what, what DAP would describe as the emergency uh, rehabilitation period and not very focused on the longer term emergence of the health system uh, in, the post, in the longer term post-conflict period. A lot of topics are neglected. There's coverage of the obvious things about user charges, about uh, staff recruitment, but there's very little about more complex issues about, for example, um, the interrelationships between policies that are, that, that are introduced, which in our view is, is probably the most, the most critical set of issues that are most neglected. <coughs> and methodologically, it tends to be a lot of rapid assessment stuff. For all the reasons, like I said, well, you know, research is neglected in these areas. People don't go and uh, live in um, conflict-affected parts of DRC for three years and get a strong sense of what's really going on, they go in and out um, and have a quick picture for you, but it's not, you're not sure how reliable it is. Um, so two uh, overviews, one we did, of, uh, which was published in Social Science and Medicine, of the, of the financing uh, literature in, in fragile and close conflict states. And the key thing that comes out of that financing literature is that there is a role for health financing policy in establishing what the values of the health system are and perhaps in um, <coughs> acting as a, as a peace broker. Because if your health financing system expresses social solidarity, inclusion and equity by, for example, making sure that everybody has access, keeping um, entry fees to the system to a minimum, if it expresses reconciliation by, for example, making sure that it allocates resources to areas that have been, are the losers, if it's, if it's been a geographical uh, civil war, um, then uh, if it establishes people's rights to access, if it allows people to participate uh, in the management of funds, um, and if it expresses confidence in public stewardship, it can play a role in helping to reunite society. That's the key thing that comes out that's different from, from what comes out from um, health financing discussions in stable states. And moving on to the human resources literature review, two or three things come out of it. Um, one is that labour markets are significantly disrupted by conflict. And there is the, in those early stages, there's a need to get labour markets working again. Uh, there hasn't been much uh, production and recruitment of new health workers over the time, so that can give you a gap in your uh, health system seniority structures. There's a whole generation that might not be there, and that causes all sorts of issues. Um, you've got people living left, which causes the same kind of problems. Uh, sometimes the public sector has stopped paying people, and they've wandered off and got jobs elsewhere, even though they've never actually resigned their posts. So how do you get them back in? to the public system that we've got to work for NGOs. And in the immediate post-conflict period, you often got a big in intake of expatriate health workers who come because uh, international agencies are paying high salaries for short-term short work. And that uh, affects how the whole labor market is working as well. Another thing that emerges is that conflict and this, this immediate aftermath has particular hazards for health workers, even more so uh, than for other members of the population, because health workers are prized resources for conflicting parties. If you're um, an army, you need health workers. You need health workers more than you need anybody else almost. 
Um, and so there's lots of stories, for example, of health workers having to uh, hide who they are <coughs> to move around. If they move around in an ambulance, they're actually more vulnerable rather than less vulnerable, quite often. Um, also because they're in charge of trying to, for example, retain the drug supply for the local population. Again, it's a prized resource and it can, be, it can make them particularly vulnerable if they try to stand up to, to rebel forces who might want to um, loot uh, drug stores, for example. Um, of course, they've dealt with lots of increased workload because there's lots of injuries and, and, and damage being caused by, by conflict. And with all this going on, it's often the same the case that the support systems are failing them even more. So I mentioned earlier not paying them, but also no supervision. Maybe drug supply systems aren't coming through, so they're more uh, likely not to have resources uh, than in, in unstable situations. So this sort of shows how health systems, health worker livelihoods are disrupted. Uh, then that's often followed by temporary arrangements that patch things up for the emergency period but don't necessarily lay the groundwork for a long-term uh, system uh, that's going to function well in the long-term future to emerge. Um, so the challenge is to reinstate administrative systems and, and, and an incentive environment, or in other words, the labour market, that will get health workers um, back uh, in working in more normal uh, and long-term development roles. And then the third area that emerges as important from the human resource uh, review is just the complexity of the many actors that emerge in, in, in conflict and post-conflict settings, international and local NGOs, private sector entrepreneurs, lots of uh, increased role for international agencies in funding uh, the, health, the health sector, um, and so the big issue is always the question of what's the capacity to coordinate because obviously you've got a new government, the state capacity would be very weak. Um, if a lot of senior people have left the country, which is often the case, you've maybe got very junior people in charge of that government coordination role and they're not very able to stand up to donors and say, well, we want what you're bringing, but we don't want what you're bringing. They're at least able to do that. And that's related to a sense of weakness of health system leadership. There may not be a clear vision because people may be being pushed this way by USA, that way by DFID, um, and they're not uh, able to, to manage that. Um, and that raises lots of questions for, for aid effectiveness, um, alignment, uh, state building, and so on. I think that's the, the literature you rushed through. So, Sierra Leone, a little bit more uh, in depth on Sierra Leone. Um, very brief uh, run through the conflict. I think most people are aware of it because they've seen blood diamonds or, or something. A really you know, a nasty, I'm not sure there are any conflicts that aren't extremely nasty, but an extremely nasty conflict. Um, the, there's a <coughs> population division in Sierra Leone. Uh, which you may know is a, a place for returned slaves, so slaves that were being returned from America in the 19th century, and in Britain to a certain extent, um, were kind of dumped in Liberia and Sierra Leone and became quite large populations with quite different um, cultures and histories and interests from the indigenous population from which they were kind of assumed to have, to have originated. The interior where the Creole, where the um, Creoles or former slaves are not, has you know, traditionally been ruled through chiefdoms, which are uh, very powerful. Um, the chiefs are very powerful uh, in the interior of the country. Diamonds were discovered in the 1930s, and by 1962 they were 60 percent of export earnings, so they're incredibly important in the economy of Sierra Leone. And during that, um, or after that period, when they've been established as being the main driver of Sierra Leone's economy. They mostly had one party state under Stevens, and corruption uh, and economic mismanagement uh, have been rife in the world. This has been a kind of looter's uh, state uh, for a very long time. It continued after Stevens was replaced by no uh, change in personnel, but no change in, in character of the state. 
And that's the background to the conflict beginning in 1991 with the Revolution of the United Front and Versanko um, overturning the government in 92. Follows these 10 years of conflict, 50,000 people killed, 50% of the population displaced, which gives you a sense of just how uh, widespread the conflict was and how far it reached into the lives of basically everybody. Uh, I think what's particularly well known about Sierra Leone's conflict is the number of child soldiers who were very much in there. Between 2000 and 2002, uh, the UK intervened and essentially, really one of the most successful uh, Western led attempts to bring peace uh, to, a, to a country, probably best done in a small country whose conflict doesn't have major um, regional uh, affiliations, although there were, of course, links to conflicts in, in Liberia and throughout West Africa. Um, and the first real sort of uh, democratic elections uh, returning. So what does that, all that have to do with the story about health systems and, and, and conflict? One is that the, you know, the collapse and the conflict has got both greed and grievance roots. And the big debate about conflict is, is always, you know, is it greed? Is it people wanting their share of the diamonds with no uh, public interest uh, whatsoever? Or is it grievance? Is it people who feel, feel that the national cake has not been uh, fairly shared, that they haven't got any opportunities, and therefore they've got nothing to lose by, by trying to uh, disrupt things. Uh, you can see both, both types of explanations in, in, in all that. There's, uh, the diamonds are clearly a, you know, a big temptation for the greedy, and the very poor uh, performance of the government clearly uh, leads to huge grievances. You can see both in the history there. Um, as in most countries, IMF interventions uh, did not achieve what they set out to achieve um, in the 1970s, and so there was no economic recovery and no um, solution to the problems of economic mismanagement and corruption. And the health financing structure that emerges from that is really um, a reflection of all those issues. If you've got 91% of health expenditure private, and 95% of health expenditure out of pocket health expenditure, in other words, there's no effective insurance mechanism for the population, then essentially you have no social protection against the cost of the wealth whatsoever. And it exemplifies the, the grievance problem. It's really people don't have, a, have, a, have a, uh, a stake in a state that offers them so little in the health system. Uh, gives, you, gives you a good sense of that. Well, I think I've already, already made that point. Another interesting argument that sort of links the health system developments to the, to the conflict is the notion that aid is itself a potential uh, source of uh, conflict in that it gives people something to fight over. So if you have a lot of international aid and uh, it's um, reflected in, for example, health facilities having a good supply of drugs, uh, health workers being well trained, that gives you a resource to fight over that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be there otherwise. If nobody has anything, there's nothing much to, to fight over. Um, and so the question, and I think this is, this is fairly well established for aid in general, but aid is fungible if it's easily muted and um, um, its ownership is shifted. To what extent is aid relative to other kinds of, uh, is health aid related, relative to other kinds of aid? <coughs> Sense. I think it's argued that clearly some elements of it are like light drug supply. In the 1980s, there was significant external aid, but it seems to have been remarkably ineffective. So, looking at a study from 1984, some, you know, quite a significant proportion of chiefdoms had no medical facilities whatsoever. A very small percent of children were enrolled in the health clinic. So that shows you that this problem that's reflected in the later 90s in that study of uh, health financing um, is uh, already pretty clear in the early 1980s. After the early 1980s, public health expenditure declined by 60%. So from this position, where it really wasn't getting, doing much anyway, it then loses 60%. So you can see the grievance case um, getting stronger and stronger. And this suggests that what 
government facilities that were, uh, were, were pretty ineffective. I've missed a, a, ref, a citation for this, but a study of the National Action Plan for Primary Health Care that was present in the 1980s essentially suggested that it was a World Bank fiction, that the World Bank was not engaging with the political realities. It was a paper exercise designed to show that the World Bank money could be effective and that it, uh, it, it was, it was a, a never going to be uh, a useful um, policy. Um, and now another study um, in the post-conflict period says almost exactly the same thing. The donors are all there with their lovely policies that look beautiful on paper, but they're completely failing to engage with realities uh, of both political, political, economic, and infrastructural on the ground. Um, we probably had a chance to skim that quote, but I'm not going to read it out. And some of the things that are part of those lovely plans uh, that the donors are introducing are the free healthcare policy, which is heavily donor dependent, a large salary uplift, which is also heavily donor dependent and accompanied by you know, getting rid of ghost workers and so on, so that the large salaries are not being paid to people who don't exist. Um, by far the largest salary uplift is for doctors who are completely irrelevant really to the Sierra Leone uh, situation. They're almost all in free time and uh, almost all in the private sector. And so uh, even if they have public sector jobs, they're almost spending all their time doing private sector work. And so there is you know, an example there of, I think, a failure to engage with realities in Sierra Leone and what matters, although I'm sure part of the political realities is the, the dominance of doctors in the system, and they probably need to be brought off like that to allow anything to happen. Um, they're also in the very early stages of some performance-based contracts with districts, which is a, a popular policy idea in those conflict settings, that this is a way to get the health system moving without necessarily strong institutions. So that's a controversial one. So these are the things that are look nice on paper and are part of what we're looking at in the context of the, context of the rebuild program to understand uh, their implications. So then I think we can see, you know, we look at these lists of things, are they, are they more like the new brander list of problems or are they more like the, the uh, Macarari list of problems that we talked about earlier? Certainly you can see all these problems in the Sierra Leone uh, case, but that's not surprising because you'd expect to see these problems in any low-income country. Some qualitatively different things which may not be exactly uh, the Macarari list, but I think um, um, you know, are important. So these issues about the links between the peace process and the health system that are largely being ignored by these paper exercises. What do, what do you really, how do you really engage in, with decentralization uh, with a world run by these chiefs who are not clearly interested in the well-being of the populations that they rule, for example. Is there any recognition of that in the uh, health policies? It doesn't seem to be much from looking at the documents. Um, there are these issues of discontinuities in the health workforce, uh, like a missing age cohort of health workers, and that does mean that you might have a new junior inexperienced people and some much more experienced senior people and no one to bridge the gap between the two, which is seemed to be quite important. And very big issues of multiple agency involvement. There's been lots of fighting between the different aid agencies, for example, over the free health care policy and let's just go back up a second. Uh, there's really been some, some one, one aid agency in particular, DFID, has really been pushing this accompanied by this, and this has been much more pushed by the bank and USAID, and the extent to which they're fitting together um, is not at all clear yet, and is, is, is a clear implication of um, this problem, because the uh, gap in the Ministry of Health in terms of its ability to coordinate the same one person, we don't want that, rather people get pushed one way and then the other, depending on who they're talking to at the moment. So also, if you remember back to that DAC um, chart of you know, how we expect countries to be emerging from conflict, and there was an emergency period and then a, um, a normalcy uh, development 
seems pretty clear to us in Sierra Leone that there's been two stages. One is that the humanitarian agencies who were there to deal with the emergency have generally been receding, while the international agencies that fund development rather than um, rather than emergencies have moved in, like DFID and the World Bank. But there seems to be now, much more importantly, a, a further transition of the Sierra Leone government getting back control from those uh, international financing agencies uh, of the health sector. And that's taking a much longer time. It's definitely nowhere near complete. It's at its very early stages. So that's part of what suggests to us that we need a longer term understanding uh, of the transitions and, and the multiple transitions that are involved. Okay, I've got very little time left because I do want us to have some time for discussion, so I'm just going to pick out a few things about Zimbabwe uh, so that gives it in five minutes and then, and then hand over to, to you for your thoughts. I think probably people have a pretty pretty good idea or a rough idea, as rough as these slides can do, about the, the nature of the conflict. As I already mentioned, some of the um, ways in which Zimbabwe might be considered conflict affected, I've already considered some of the um, economic developments that, uh, that were later than that. Um, if we think about the health system before, during, and after conflict, before it was a, a South African apartheid type regime, a racially discriminating health system. Post independence, in the immediate post independence period, there was huge positive developments in the Zimbabwe health system. And a massive increase in spending, concentration on primary care, quite palpable and clearly documented improvements in access to care and improvements in quality of uh, care that people were receiving. But it was quite short lived because it didn't take long before the economic problems started to undermine the capacity to continue to build that. Those economic problems are linked, but perhaps not entirely due to the economic and structural adjustment program. Everybody in Zimbabwe thinks it was the economic and structural adjustment program that ruined their country. Well, I tend to be a bit sceptical about that, um, because economic and structural adjustment programs come along when you've already got an economic crisis, and it's difficult for people experiencing it to distinguish what's the economic crisis and what's the economic and structural adjustment program. This program was absolutely appalling, and I've never seen a worse one. Um, pro money that was promised them didn't arrive to the point they had to sell, um, food that they were then that then caused famine, and then they had to buy food back at about ten times the price that they they'd sold um, maize essentially at. Um, just among many of the complete mismanagement by the big international agencies of the program. So, irrespective of your ideology or your economic analysis of the uh, pluses and minuses of, of, of structural adjustment programs, this was an appalling one that definitely. I didn't do, didn't do Zimbabwe any favours. On the other hand, it's very difficult to, un to unpick the effects of the economic crisis that predated the Structural Adjustment Programme, droughts that occurred at uh, critical periods, and the adjustment policies themselves. It's a complete preoccupation of the Zimbabwean health system's literature, though, to be analysing the effect of structural adjustment. We've almost asked no other questions. There aren't very clear implications of the uh, economic crisis of the, of the late uh, 2000s um, on the health system. So there's mass emigration that I think most people know about, closure of rural facilities in part, in part, um, part of the violence and intimidation of rural areas that were threatening not to support uh, Mugabe. Um, Lots of documentation, particularly of central hospitals, because that's where your expatriate doctors who are writing letters to the Lancet to, tell, to talk about the dreadful uh, conditions. There are lots of documentations of dreadful conditions in central hospitals. Um, the cholera epidemic can very clearly be linked to the economic crisis. It came from a failure to invest in uh, preventive programs that have been, and prevention in, in general, that have been effective for, for decades. Um, massive epidemic um, by, by modern day standards of cholera. Um, and one study, although I think it's as difficult to do as the structural adjustment stuff, um, suggests that, that 3,900 child deaths a year could be attributed to 
does Zimbabwe fit? I'm just going to finish on this and, and, and hand over to you. Well, some of these things uh, are there, and you'd expect them to be there in a lower middle income country anyway. Um, not particularly um, exclusion of population groups. And because aid has been limited throughout this period, these issues of aid alignment have not been very important in Zimbabwe. If you look at the qualitative differences, um, well, there hasn't been a peace process exactly, so there's nothing really to look at, to look at there. Um, it's likely to be this missing age cohort in the future because there has been a mass migration of health workers and a failure to recruit new ones during the crisis. It's not so obvious yet. And these things don't apply, which suggests to me that perhaps Zimbabwe is better to be used as, as a sort of a different kind of disruption that can help us understand what's related to conflict in the classical sense of armed military conflict and what's related to to wider disruption. I'm going to stop there because I'm really interested in what you think, having, thought, having heard all that, think about whether post-conflict health systems are different from others and need to be studied separately, or whether the issues that arise from health systems in general um, are the same ones here and we can, we can safely uh, treat post-conflict.